Well, good afternoon, everyone. It really is blinding up here. Um, so I'm a, I'm a brain scientist, which means uh, I'm interested in how the brain works. And for about the past 30 or 35 years, I've been mucking around in the brain trying to figure out what it does. In particular, I'm interested in how you turn thoughts into action, how you think about something and then it just becomes very naturally an action. And about, uh, really now about 15 years ago, we realized that we knew something, not a lot, but we knew enough that we could actually take signals from the brain, take them outside and deliver them to devices and use that as a device called BrainGate that could allow people who are paralyzed to at least interact with the world, but they could potentially actually uh, uh, reanimate their own limbs. So the vision, the long-term vision for this device is shown here, where there's a device implanted in the brain that transmits brain signals out and uh, allows a, a, a person to move who's paralyzed. Now, when you and I move, we have uh, commands generated in our brain, like say you want to reach out and have a glass of water. Uh, you, you think about it, and actually it just seems to unfold very naturally. And what happens is, is there's a pencil-lead thin bunch of fibers, about a million of them, called axons, that travel down from your brain to your spinal cord. And that, uh, that fiber pathway carries the commands. And those commands light up your spinal cord, and you reach out and grasp some, something like your glass of water. Now, if a person who has a spinal cord injury or a person that has a stroke, or anywhere along that pathway, that ability is gone. You can think about moving, you can intend to move, but you can't do it. And if you think about it, try about how debilitating this is, just try sitting on your hands for the first hour when you work. You can't, as one of our patients said, you know, not only can't you drink, can't drink you can't groom, you can't eat, but you, you can't even scratch your nose. So it's, it, you, you could become completely reliant on other people. So what I want to do is tell you the story of BrainGate and how it's gone. It's been a very interesting path. It's been a very exciting path from work that started out as very basic science. What we say is something, you know, you couldn't go home and tell your grandmother what I was doing because they would be sound asleep after I told them about, you know, looking at action potentials and neurons, to something that I think, I hope all of you will get at the end, is that you can actually uh, reanimate muscles, which means you can make paralyzed people move again. So, as I said, here's the vision that there's a device in the brain, it bypasses this injury, and it's a physical nervous system that can then do something like go to a stimulator and have physical nerves in your arm and make your arm able to react to your commands and be able to drink again. So this is not totally crazy, uh, as, although it may sound that way, that you can actually do something like this. And in fact, I think many of you will see that we're actually much further along in developing neurotechnology that interfaces with the brain than you would ever expect. So uh, there's a different kind of technology that's being developed that stimulates the brain. It tickles the brain, it neuromodulates it is the term. And um, basically, uh, for treating a range of disorders, most of them movement, but not all of them, uh, there are people who have had noodle-sized electrodes stuck two and a half inches into their head. There's electrical stimulation that's gone on in a very localized target about the size of a Tic Tac candy. And it takes a person who is shaking and stiff and unable to walk well, like the lady that you see, uh, and, uh, and because of her Parkinson's disease, and it, oh, it masks the symptoms, it wipes them out so she can move and you can see the before and after the stimulation. So uh, one, of the, one thing I like to ask audiences like this is, how many people do you think have electively, because this doesn't cure the disease, how many people do you think have electively had this procedure done? Any guesses? Somebody volunteer a number. Yeah, 80,000. So there are now 80,000 people walking around with electrodes in their head. So neurotechnology is here. These are brain interfaces that are being used every day to help people with Parkinson's disease. And, <clears throat> and, and uh, it, it is really an extraordinary technology. So we can put devices in brains, but BrainGate is really something that's a little bit different. Instead of putting signals into the brain, we're trying to read out what's going on in the brain so we can build a bridge to the world for people who have no communication from their brain to their body. So this idea, you know, thoughts of, of, of using your brain telepathy or direct connections between the brain and machines is something that's been, you know, sort of sci-fi stuff for a long time. Uh, the problems are things like you have to sense the signals, and you'll see that's a big problem. You have to translate them into something that's uh, a meaningful control signal for a machine. We call that the decoding problem, and you have to learn how to operate devices. <clears throat> so those are big problems, and being a professor, I have to 
you know, I, I'm, I'm just compelled to sort of give you a little lesson in basic neuroscience so you can go home and understand and explain to others that this isn't science fiction, it's not magic, that we actually know enough that we can do something reasonably intelligent to try and help people move again who are paralyzed. So one thing we know is that um, the commands to move your arm are in a little spot about where that red square is. And that, that little spot is, uh, we've actually known for more than 100 years, is the command center for moving your arm for when you reach and grasp. And it sits in the middle of a region where just a little above it is a place for controlling your leg and a little to the side, sort of out towards the side of your face, is a, is a place to control, to control your face. So we know where to go uh, uh, to, to target the uh, activity that is the command center. But the problem is, is that the signals that are generated in that area are really tiny and complicated. So you can think of neurons like little digital radio broadcast towers about the size of a pin, and a pin head, actually. And so about 10,000 of them can fit in something the size of a pea. So there's a whole lot of them. And what they do is they emit uh, electrical impulses all the time. You'll get to hear some actual human electrical impulses in a couple of minutes. Those electrical impulses uh, come out in a pattern that is, represented, that is representing what's going on as you're thinking about moving or actually anything else that's going on in your brain. So each cell has kind of a somewhat special function, but since they're all packed together, we can't just read one, we have to read many. And one of the other problems is, is that our sensors have to be very close because the signals don't travel very far. So um, what, what we had to do is invent a technology that would allow us to pick up some number. We didn't even know the right number, we guessed. We said 100 and we made this hairbrush thing we was with my, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dick Norman, at the University of Utah, and made this little hairbrush thing. It's really tiny. It's only about the size of a baby aspirin, so it looks kind of giant on the screen, but it's not that big. Uh, and a neurosurgeon can put that into the brain, so the electrodes can nuzzle up close to some of those radio broadcast towers and pick up some of that information. So what comes out is a pattern. And the whole job of neurophysiologists, like me, is to, to understand the brain, is to figure out what these patterns are all about. So the pattern is something like these QR codes, which I assume everyone has seen. They're on everything now. They're a way to identify uh, various products and get information. The QR code uh, is, is, again, like this pattern of activity. So if you think of each black or white square like an impulse coming from one neuron. So there's many, many of them there. And the, actually, unlike the QR code is on a package in our brain, they're flickering about 100 times a second. So we don't have, we can't go to Apple and get an app that's a QR reader. We have to actually develop that based on all our knowledge of the nervous system. And we can guess, and we can guess pretty well, but not perfectly, that some of the patterns mean, say, move my hand to the left, and other patterns mean move my hand to the right. And there are actually patterns associated with all kinds of movements. And because they're changing, we can update that, and we can guess sort of what you're trying to do from that pattern of brain activity. So here's where sort of the business innovation part comes in. When we completed all of those sort of trial studies in animals, actually in monkeys playing video games, and uh, in my lab at Brown over many years, and we realized, when we realized that we might be able to translate this, this kind of device, this brain gate, into humans, I decided to start a company, and I had no idea, I was just, you know, a pointy-headed academic living in his ivory tower, not knowing the complexities of starting a business, but uh, we, uh, several of us banded together. We were actually quite successful. Oxford Bioscience and Slater Foundation here in Rhode Island lent us some money. We had a little office down the street. Uh, and, 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 and lo and behold, we raised initially $6 million and eventually $22 million in a company called Cyberkinetics. The problem we had, and I won't go into the story in any detail, are, are several fold. One is these devices, especially really complicated medical devices like this, are $100 or $150 million projects. We raised about $20 million. <clears throat> the company needed money in November of 2008, not a great time to go out and say you want to do something as ambitious as this. So we, we, uh, so we, we raised, we, we, the company went out of business in 2008, and we did something unusual. We brought the, 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 all of the activity, the clinical trial that I'll tell you about, back into the academic setting. So it's now a collaboration between Mass General and Brown, and thanks to the federal funding, we actually are able to continue this, and you'll see what we've been doing. We've enrolled seven people so far, all of them are paralyzed and have received the implant. So one thing we, we've done, which I, I, you know, as a neurophysiologist you always get excited about hearing brain activity, you're going to hear the, uh, uh, a technician telling one of our patients who's been paralyzed for more than ten years or nine years that, that uh, to imagine uh, moving her hand and you're going to listen in and that pink 
uh, little waveform you see is one of these spikes, one of these electrical impulses. And you're going to see, you're going to hear that change its firing, and that's, you're listening into the thought of movement. So if this works, let me have the volume up. Now imagine you're opening your hand. Relax. Close your hand. Relax. Open your hand. So I think you can hear that, that you're listening to human thought about moving. And so our job is to make sense out of that. But I think you could even decode yourself. You could hear when she, when she was opening her hand, it crackled a lot. And it didn't crackle much when she closed her hand. So we can build a decoder to, to actually translate those patterns of activity into some kind of movement. So here you see the first patient in our study, Matt, who had a spinal cord injury. He couldn't move his arms and legs, and he couldn't even breathe on his own. Uh, playing a video game, so we tried with a computer cursor and asked him to play a video game. In this video game, he's supposed to hit the treasure chests, which are the non-squares, and avoid the goblins. And so he's not great, but he's uh, actually running that cursor, not with the millions of neurons that you and I use to drive our spinal cord, but actually going directly from a few dozen neurons in his motor cortex directly to the outside. So this proved that we could actually do this. And how it works, uh, we'll let Matt explain. Oh man, I can't put it into words. It just, I, I used my brain. I just thought it. I said, Curse, go up to the top right, and it did. And now I got control of it all over the screen. It's wild. I think that, that captures it. It's wild. And in fact, he didn't actually understand, just like we don't understand what happens when we move our arms around. So, so then we, of course, were elated, and in these early days, we said, okay, let's find something that Matt can control. We gave him this prosthetic hand that opens and closes, and we told him, your brain is hooked to this hand, open and close it, and so you'll listen to his reaction, which it isn't very impressive in what it can do, just what, what his reaction was. Close, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so... At that point, I told the students and the, and the people in the company, if we never really succeed with this project, you've done something that's really meaningful to a person who can't do anything else for himself. But we did go on from there, and we actually were very ambitious and said, okay, what we really want is people to be able to carry out their arm and hand functions. So one of the things we're working on now is actually having our patients control a robotic arm, and we gave them what turns out to be actually a pretty hard task. They're controlling... Uh, here you see one of our, our stroke patients, Kathy, you'll see her a couple of times. And she's controlling this robotic arm, and uh, she's moving it in three dimensions in space and grabbing the ball. And it's, we were shocked that there was enough information from this little tiny patch of the brain for her to actually do that. But she could do it, and uh, this was a paper that we just published showing that people can actually perform these actions. So what we did is, Kathy every morning has a cinnamon latte that she has served to her because she can't feed herself, and she hasn't, uh, in this case, in this video, she hadn't, hadn't had a drink on her own or fed herself in 15 years. She's been completely reliant on other people. And here she is using another kind of robot that we're working with, and she's taking her first sip of her cin morning cinnamon la latte under her own brain power. So it's, it's really an extraordinary event. And if you look, I've just froze frame the, the, last, uh, the, the last picture of her sort of, yay, I've done it. You know? So Kathy is otherwise unable to speak and unable to move at all. So it, this is really an extraordinary event. This is where we are. We want to do much better than this. We want to take this signal and put it not only into the robot arms, but even eventually into their own arms. And this got a lot of notoriety. Kathy wound up on the front page of the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. And that was really cool for her. <laughs> Now, there's a lot of challenges ahead. You know, we, we've got these sort of simple kind of demonstrations, but as I think you saw in some of the pictures, we plugged the person in. Uh, they have connected to all kinds of electronics, and thanks to my colleagues at Brown, uh, who are remarkable engineers and physicists, we're making this fully implantable device that reduces about a cigar box size of electronics down to something smaller than a Zippo lighter that will be fully implanted in the head. And so this is something that is, uh, is emerging now, and in fact, we're, we're in testing, and we're hoping in a couple of years there'll be people that will have this device all the time available to them doing whatever they want whenever they want to. So one metric of how far you've succeeded is to compare to science fiction. So there's uh, Star Trek is one, and if you remember, Captain Pike was fully disabled in, a, in an accident. Captain Kirk goes to visit him, and you can see his brain-computer interface uh, that he had at that time.
about the great acting. <laughs> you remember these gentlemen. They wanted to visit you. Two flashes mean no. So, so that I was Star Trek supposedly date 3012, right? And so somebody told me that's not a thousand years from now, by the way, but, but somehow it's a long time into the future. Well, we're doing better than that because Kathy's doing not beeps, but she's actually drinking her coffee with a robotic arm. But then you jump ahead to Star Wars and you have Luke getting his new hand. And of course, when he had his hand cut off, if you remember the movie, he had his, he had his hand chopped off by his father, no less. Um, <clears throat> that, that, uh, that he had this arm replaced immediately and not only did it work instantly, and notice not, not even a sterile surgical field here, just a, you know, in the room, that he's, he's actually instantly moving and feeling. So we're not there yet. So we're someplace between Star Trek and Star Wars and whatever date we, we could be. So, thank you. So I, I really want to emphasize that this is uh, not only was it something that was made possible by investment of private capital, which, which in the end did not pay a, a profit for anyone, but was an extraordinary boost because I think the field would never be where it is today without that private investment. And secondly, that this is a team effort and I have extraordinary colleagues and the only way complicated projects can work like this is for people to cooperate and work together taking lessons from the wonderful talks we heard this morning. So with that, thanks very much.